everyone. In this recording, I sort of go over um, how to um, remove images, duplicate images using Python script. But to do that, I need to teach you guys a little bit of the concepts of um, image and how images and how they are represented as data in matrices and how that kind of tags in, like what are pixels, what are images um, represented as in by a computer, much like how um, blind individuals use Braille. How does a computer represent or understand an image um, in terms of its pixels? And how can we kind of theoretically understand that to be able to look at um, this really awesome code to remove duplicates um, um, of images using Python? So please bear with me as I walk through the concepts behind images and pixels and removing these duplicates. And please let me know if you have any questions at all. So you can imagine this being a pixel and maybe I can draw another line like this being another pixel, you know, like these all as being pixels, each of these pixels. And you're trying to basically discover like, you know, that this is um, the, the dimensions of the pixel dimensions and you're trying to assign a set of colors. So each and every single value in um, an image so it can be assigned these values. So these are basically what these colors are, is they're coming from this code, um, like, you know, um, pixel colors TV. So if you look at a pixel color in TV, it says each pixel is composed of three subpixels, one for each of the primary colors, red, blue, and green. Um, so, what these are um, is, is, if you look at any image in particular, you'll see that it has red, green, blue. It has this kind of like this static, this color over here. And what you're going to observe is that in very old TVs, like um, when I was growing up with a very old, one of our TVs was old and I could observe that if there was no cable, it just looked like this. You could just see static, like static, red, blue, green. These are how even the codes and receptors in our eyes, um, IgG cones and rods, eyes. Even in our eyes, within the retina, there are two parts, the cones and the rods. The cones in our eyes are responsible for the colors and the ro rods are responsible for dark adaptation vision. The cones in our eyes, you know, behind the scenes, they are made up of red, green, and blue, which are the additive colors. So the science of the eye over here kind of talks about how these colors are working, you know, red, blue, and green. So it's not just made up from nowhere. This comes from our eyes, red, green, blue. So are you, do you want to read this part here? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so the human eye sees a computer or TV screen differently to any other being due to our camera type eyes. You may know that screens and monitors are made up of little dots, which are called pixels. Well, these pixels within red, green, blue, or RGB and composed of the three primary colors. Each tiny pixel consists of even smaller dots or pixels which shine a distinct color. One pixel is made of RGB, even though we can't see them with the naked eye due to how small they are. Modern screens have such high resolutions that the only feasible way to see them would be to magnify right in. Yes, awesome, thank you. So it's like if you zoom in, if you have a forest, We have a forest, right? Like imagine that it's a forest and um, like you just see the whole forest, all these, you know, you see all these forests and um, and it's like you you see a forest and it's like zooming, zooming, zooming in into a, like a small little leaf in that forest, for instance, like on a tree, a leaf on a tree in a forest. It's like zooming into this small little thing here in this giant forest. That's what it is in each image. Like each and every single dot is a pixel and together it's like, like to make a painting, to make any like masterpiece, for instance, to even make um, 
like like for instance to make this like lego kit here to make this lego set each and every single uh, lego piece is made up of all these bricks here that you can see it's made up of you know um this van and um the wheels everything is like a lego piece here each and every one of these is a lego piece i, I love legos um and you can see that you can take apart for instance can i take this apart yeah, okay, I can take this small little piece apart from this um, ice cream truck and I can also put it back on. And it's like each and every single piece in this car, it's like it's like a pixel, for instance, like a pixel in an image, right? Each Lego in this um, ice cream truck is like a pixel in an image. They make it up and you don't sometimes see it, but if you take it apart and you look at what that Lego um, set is made up of, that's like what a pixel is. And um, that's sort of how you can interpret it. So you scan along and the pixels, each of these colored values inside is made up of red, green, blue. They have a set of those values that um, now if I memorize this, um, I, I can, if I, so this is 255 for red and something else. If I, I can change this to being like maybe 76 and then you see how this changes to this, right? 76, I can change this to being like 255 and it will change. It's like an ID. Each of these colors has an ID in terms of its red, green, and blue values, especially in paint. And that's what you can think of as you scan along, you can see how these three values change because that's even behind our eyes, those rods and cones, those cones that are detecting RGB are in our eyes. So that's the idea here that, you know, we have, you know, they combine to produce a broad array of colors. So ever stop to think how we are able to see all of these pixels, right? So do you want to read this part over here? Hello? Mm-hmm. Okay, um, the human eye belongs to a group of eyes found in nature called camera tap eyes, which as it sounds, believe it or not, works very similar to a camera lens. The lens focuses light into film. A structure in the eye called the cornea does just this and focuses light into a light-sensitive membrane called the retina. When we look on, when we look any object when we look at any object including the tv light enters the eye through the pupil which then changes the size of our pupils depending on how bright the light is the lens focuses the light through to the back of the eye where it is recorded in the retina this is a place where a mass number of neurons live called photoreceptors these light sensitive neurons change light signals into electrical ones the human eye works in conjunction with the brain to translate these lights into what we call, what we see as colors. Color is not inherent in objects, but the surface of an object reflects some colors and absorbs others. The human eye only perceives reflective colors. For example, a red apple. The red is not in the apple, but the surface of the apple is reflecting certain wavelengths which we see as red. The color we see is only a sensation. Within the retina, there are two parts, the cones and the rods. The cones in our eyes are responsible for the colors and the rods are responsible for dark adaptation vision. The cones are made up of red, green, and blue, which are the adaptive colors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So if you see um, any of these, right? So the cones in our eyes are made up of red, green, and blue. These are additive colors. So an analogy is like seeing any image here, for instance, of like in the happy baby example, now this baby's cute. So you can almost like keep on zooming in. So it's just loading this image of happy holiday baby. And you can keep on zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. And then you're going to see eventually as you scale in. Um, so if I wanted to also um, look at the properties of this, um, I can see that this happy holiday baby, um, what is the size on the desk, details, I can see it's 550 pixels wide and 328 pixels high. So this is just um, all this other information on about this as well, like where is it stored, all that stuff. 
but you can see that it's made up of all these pixels. So what that code will do when it's checking is it's going to see that each image essentially is made up of a set of values um, and red values, green values, and blue values. So you can think of it as, as checking as it's scanning across each, it's dividing them into a grid of, you know, it's dividing it into a grid, if you will, of these values. So I'm going to show, um, image data represented in matrix here. Okay. So for instance, like if we look at um, the Abraham Lincoln example, um, uh, this one is black and white. So this is just this. So before we had color TV, we had this grayscale TV, you know, maybe your grandparents or uh, their time period could remember this. But you can see that um, beforehand, the easiest thing was to convert an image to black and white, just one channel, because um, color requires three channels, red, green, and blue. So you can see any image, like if this is um, Abraham Lincoln, pretend that this is a pixel, 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 pixel. If each of these um, um, boxes here, it's like a pixel. Like, so this is a, a pixel, for instance, and then this pixel here maps to 166. So that's what you can view this as. So this will map here to 166. And then this, and so that's what you, you see here, that that's how we, we got um, each of these pixels. And we map them to a set of colors. Now this is black and white. For colored images, we have the color scale, um, you know, red, green, and blue. So we do the same thing where we have a red matrix that is going to map each of these pixels. If it's a colored image, it maps them to the set of red values. So what that does is it basically, it goes across pixel by pixel. So imagine that um, this is one row and that this is like another row. I know it's not drawn to scale. Imagine that this is another row. Oh gosh. Have these values here. Um, oh gosh. Like something like this, and this is like one row, another row. Um, Okay, pretend that this is just a row of pixels. This is one row, one, like, it's, I know it's not drawn to scale, but pretend that this is almost like what, what this is. Like, you know, I'm trying to create this grid here, a grid. And what you can do is you, you're going across this and you're getting a set of colors. Like this color is red, is this value green, blue. So for a red matrix, I'll just take, go across and focus on this first value of red. Then what I'm going to do is as I'm going along, like let's say that I'm already over here um, in this pixel. So each of these dots is a pixel. So for instance, like let's say that it's it's red. I'm going to see that red has 237. Um, I'm going to focus on those values for the red matrix. Then for the green matrix, I'm going to focus on those green values. For the blue matrix, I'll focus on the blue value here. So that's what is happening essentially here. It's taking an image and an image of a cat, for instance, and it's going along and it's getting the blue values, the green values, the red values at each location. Does that quite make sense to you? Red values, you focus on the red values for this red matrix. Yeah. So um, you can show, you focus on the red values for that red matrix. You focus on the green values for the green matrix, on the blue values. And you, you know, that's what an image is represented as. Like if you had to describe it to someone, like the people who are blind, we have Braille. We have a way, we have different languages, different ways of expression. And for the way that the computer understands um, these images is in terms of these pixel values. So for the um, computer, the way that it makes sense of all this is in terms of mapping them to a value. So what it's going to do is it's going to understand the way it interprets red is as this color red that I'm using. But if I wanted to use this color red, how does it determine the difference between this red and this red? You can see that these values here are changing. Don't worry too much about these, just focus on these right now and see how these values are changing. That's how it interprets each of them. So the idea is you can really, really zoom in as much as possible on an image. You can zoom in and each of these small, small pixels you're going across and together they create 
this image for us, you can get this set of values for them. And you can map them for, to red, green, and blue values. So that's sort of how you can get those values out from them. Now you can also see here, for instance, you can get, um, let's see, this is, um, you can you can also get an S here. You can see the height and the width of a pixel and you can put it into a matrix. A matrix is basically rows by column. So you can see that this is 251, 181, um, so this is how you can represent an S, an image of an S here. So each of these values here maps to each of these. They add um, zero in front of them just so that it all lines up. This is 71. This is, this, is, um, this is 71 here. This is 32. This is 30. This is nine. They just pad it with these zeros here so that it all just lines up neatly. So you can see that this pixel and this S lines up to this value here. This lines up to 196 and this lines to 14. This is for a black and white image. So it's so much simpler. That's why we had black and white TV for a very long time. So I'll just show you black and white. We had these old TVs. So you see when a TV is not working, Initially, like this is the static I was talking about. For black and white TVs, the static look like this, very simple, white and black. You know, um, people who are colorblind, they lack certain receptors in their eyes. So it's very simple to just see white and black. You know, so watching football, watching some movies in white and black. Back in the old days, images were white and black as well. So, um, So you can even see somewhere between 1946 and 1950, the research staff of RCA Laboratories invented the world's first electronic color television system. So when did they, how did they develop color in TV, right? A color broadcast can be created by broadcasting three monochrome images, one in each of the three colors of red, green, and blue. So what they're saying is that you can break apart an image in terms of a set of blue values. So you see the red comes to front, but you can imagine that this pixel is four, this top left pixel here has four in the blue value, nine if you zoom into a pixel, right? So if, this is not drawn to scale, but this, they just simplify it in this illustration here. In reality, there'd be many pixels by many pixels. So in reality, for this image here that we were looking at, the details would say that this would be 550 pixels wide. So you'd have 550 of these, you know, dashes here by 328 pixels. So that's what would be the boundaries and that those would be how many pixels, you know, how many of those dots, those small little square dots, if you zoom in. So uh, again, to showing you seeing pixels in image. Like the way that it goes, like if you keep on and on and on zooming in to an image, you are going to get like anything that you keep zooming in even more and more, you're going to get like all these square grids that are like one by one and they each are just one color. That's what makes it up. So does that part make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Like even in an apple, you can zoom in, get a sense of these values, right? So any image you can see, you see in this image here, the Guardian, right? This looks like some place in London. It looks like Notting Hill or something maybe, but one of these places in, in the UK. If you zoom out, it looks really nice, right? And then when you zoom in, have you ever seen that you can zoom in and you can see the pixels? Like sometimes camera images are not as clear as a, a digital camera, right? So if you look at this here, it looks fine when you zoom in, but as you zoom in, you can see these small, small dots, right? Like it's grainy, right? Would you say it's grainy? Yeah. So that's sort of like a, how the pixels work in an image. That's how those pixels work. 
So you can see over here, this is an, in London, this is St. Paul's Cathedral. So um, this is a Millennial Bridge. It was a bridge destroyed in Harry Potter. I love, I've loved walking along here. It's really beautiful. Um, so this is an image here. And this is how you would take, so this is the uh, like one half and the other half, for instance, of an image. And this is how you can break apart this image here of this cathedral here in London, uh, how you can break this apart into these pixels, red, green, and blue values here, these colored channels. Each of these dots represents a pixel. And that's how these programs, they have people have written programs, they've written packages that try to go in and understand these red, green, and blue values inside an image. So that's what pixels are. That's what they represent. They're like the small little pieces, like in a Lego that makes up an ice cream truck. That's what, uh, how you can understand what pixels are in an image. So you can translate images to numeric data as well over here. So what I want to know, what an image is, is an image, like what do you guys think that this is? What does this look like a bit, if you had to guess? This looks like an image, a very blurry image of, do you guys know who this could be? Uh, Abraham Lincoln. Yes, yes, really good, awesome. Yeah, it looks like Abraham Lincoln as well. So this is an image eight. So uh, luckily for you guys, I still remember having to do this the hard way. If you want to insert equations, like I can insert, let's say I want to insert this um, equation here. Um, I equals one, do any of you guys know this? It's just a summation. I just want to show you, just don't yeah. worry about it. Okay, great, great, awesome. Why seven? Plus, like just just see what this is exactly for seven d two and then this is two x plus three okay this is just some some really weird form formula okay so don't maybe uh maybe x actually let me just because x equals this to this uh, plus three, and then maybe x to the seven. Okay, let's just keep it like this. This is an example. So I'm fast at this, and not not wrong, but I've done this like so many times in my math. Like I'm, I've majored in math. I've done this so many times because I would divide out formulas. I don't like LaTeX that much, but that doesn't mean that you guys won't like it. It depends on preference. So I would write out these formulas so much. So if you go and you insert an equation, I want to show you an example. Um, you can have basic math symbols here. You can have Greek letters, all of this in Microsoft Word, depending on whichever format, word, brackets, you can have functions, sign functions, accents, or matrix, which is actually what we'll talk about. You can have so many different notations that take place. So the idea is that if you, if you want to write something super complicated as well, these are product functions. So, the, so this is a summation. So what this is saying is that you are going from one to a hundred. You're adding up these fractions, but each time, like it's this is what this essentially is. Is it's just since I've written this out, I just want to show you what this mathematically means. That that's also educational. Uh, okay, let me copy this guy here. What this summation, guys, for those of you who don't um, know what the summation means, it's don't feel overwhelmed. So what this is saying is that I'm just going to go from x equals 1 all the way to x equals 100. So here I'm just going to put in a 1 and I'm going to do 2 times 1 plus 3 divided by this. The second time around I'm going to have x is 2 and then I'm going to have a 2 here and then the, the third and then and then I'm going to keep on going the 100 times. So then this one will be like 99 and then this will be times 99. And then this will be times 100 and, and everything else is in between. It's like I'm adding up like 100 of these essentially. And I'm just changing the value of x. Does this make sense to you guys? This is what a summation means. So I can type it out, like I can do it. But what if I, sometimes I've written really complicated formulas or you guys may need to write complicated formulas. So there's this thing I discovered, which is called an ink equation. It says instant mathematical equations using your handwriting. So what this is saying here exactly is you can write the math here with your handwriting and it's going to try to interpret it. 
So I'll show you guys. So imagine I want to write that same thing. Do you guys see what's happening? Okay, now can you guys comment on this? This is, okay, I, I wrote, like, I don't write this badly. I mean, my handwriting's not like the, 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 the neatest, but it's not this bad. I purposely wrote it like this. Okay, so it's not like, I don't really write my math like this. I'm writing it as an example. So does anybody notice something about the numbers that I put here, what they look like or what I did? Um, you experimented with the, bunch of different types of numbers and sort of like this your sevens are different your twos are different your x's are different and, and the ones as well thank you Keshav yes exactly if you if you talk to people from Germany they might write their one or from India or from many places they might write the the way that they've grown up they might some people write sevens with a dash to it some people write twos like this some people write twos like this and they write ones like this. Some people write a one like this. And even still, oh, okay. So sorry, it, it's still, now I can change it like this and it interprets something else. Like I can change it. Um, and I, and even if guys, look, see, this is not even connected, but it's still saw it connected. Like this is more connected than this, but it's still interpreted it as like an X together. It interpreted, even though this line was not over the 72, it interpreted it as a 72. So I can select and correct it. If this formula is not right, I can make changes to it. I can also erase, I can clear this off. But, it, but what's happening is that Microsoft, Microsoft Word, which is what I'm using, it's learning the information from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of what people have written. So it's supervised learning because how you might ask, how does it know what a one is, what a two is, what an eight is? So if I write it like, let's say I write my eights like this, see, I don't even write eights like this, but like, let's say that I write, like I write eights like this. It, you can still interpret that, right? But how? That's the question. You, do you guys all wonder how it learns that this is all over this, even though this line is not going over, this is what it wants to learn, right? So the idea is that all of this data, so if I'm happy with this equation, I can insert it in here. And any questions on this before I do that? Is it? Okay, so what, what's happening is that it's learning behind the scenes, each pixel. And that's why you guys need to, to understand, and maybe this will help you understand why more data is really important. Because for a neural network, which we'll talk about, it's actually that's based on the, the, the way that our brain has neurons that signal with each other, you know, to transmit information about our world, about our senses, you know, how we sense things, how we perceive things, how we act, you know, to, to connect, like putting your hand near a flame and like jerking your hand backwards, how we can connect those things in our world around us using neurons. So there's this idea that how can we essentially train this to understand this formula such that if I'm writing like this and I don't, if you guys don't even need to worry about this, I used to write these by hand and it used to be so painful, I used to go through here. And at some point they added in this ink equation thing that I'm showing you guys. And you guys can try it out and sometimes it may not be completely accurate. You can try to see how you can break it, you know. Um, my, my brother does that sometimes, he tries to see how he can break tech fun. So, but any case, in any case, the idea is that it learned that this is an X and this is this, and it learned it from hundreds and hundreds of images. So each image at the end of the day, um, let me show you this image. And then this is um, Abraham Lincoln. This is an image, hypothetically. So, so like, 
like each image is not this simple, right? Like images are like complicated, but each image at the end of the day is made up of pixels. Have you guys heard of pixels before? Yeah. Okay, great. When you guys hear about cameras, you hear about megapixels, how much data can be captured, you know? So, um, oh, oops. So what, what's happened is that an image is just essentially, and this is like a really simple, I mean, not simplified, but if you think of it, like you guys are too young. I remember, um, even for me, like we had an, an older TV and um, when it didn't have any cable on it, it would just show static like this. Um, when I was growing up, one of our older TVs had static and I could see the red, blue and green cones. These are also what goes on in our, in our eyes as well. We have these receptors, we have red, green, and blue. So then these, you know, the, the intensity, right? So let me show you this. So if you see that this is all like gradation, you guys see that this is all like gradation of colors from black to gray to this, to this, to this, to this. Each image we have, you can see hue, saturation. Do you see red, green, and blue colors here? white you guys see how this is changing mm -hmm. so that's the idea yes awesome for colored images they use red blue and green they have these three um tensors they have these three cones that are um, a part of defining what that color is exactly so that's what you see here in these images and an image at the end of the day is just mathematically mathematically represented this is just a very simple image um, but if you think of each and every dot in an image, it's a pixel. And this is an image. I mean, of course, each pixel is much smaller, you know, like really, really tiny. But they've done it this way to show you. So if you look at this image of Abraham Lincoln, you can then put this set of values that it's associated with right here. Each of these maps to a value. So this over here maps to 167. This here maps to 13. Do you guys notice anything about the numbers versus the, the color? Uh, the lower the number, the darker. Yes, exactly. So this is going from zero all the way to 255. So wherever this is lighter, then um, you can see that it's, it's darker whenever... Um, no, sorry, whenever this number is, is smaller, then it's, it's like black, like really close to being black. Whenever the number is higher, as we get higher and higher, it's getting closer and closer to white. Like this is like 250 something. And then this is an intermediate step because this image actually just goes from here all the way to here. This is just showing you how these values map. But an image is just represented as a matrix with rows and columns a set of values between the two images. That's what an image is, rows by columns here. That's what it is. And at the end of the day, we can see that this is how, we, if you were to understand Lincoln mathematically, it's like this. If you also look here in this example, guys, and this is an image eight. So they took, you, you can almost see it in a way that this does look like an eight. I remember growing up, there used to be these cute little cartoons that would take an image, like that would be a, a sentence and then you can make a human face using like, a, like one word. Have you guys seen those cartoons? Uh, I know I'm not even saying it right. Yeah, something like this. You see, you guys see this? You can take each of these as like a word. You can, that's pretty cool. Anyways, so. This is, this is this image eight. So the idea is that this is something that's called MNIST data. MNIST data set is a data set that's a handwritten data, digital database. So what they did is it has a training set of 60,000 examples and a test set of 10,000 examples. 
So it's a, it's a handwritten set of digits that has been given. And people typically use this data set for a lot of image detection projects. So what happened is they had 60,000 images of people writing numbers, like fives and fours and zeros and ones. And they, they have all these <coughs> people. So essentially they, they got people to write out like 60,000 images of, of these letters. Like how would you write a zero? How would you write a one? So you can see some people write one like different ways. Some people like this. How would you write a two? How would you write a three? How would you write a four, a five, a six, a seven, an eight, a nine? See a seven with a stick through it. A nine, even if it doesn't look. So this is just a snapshot of what the data looks like. And then people came up with predictive, like using like what we're doing. They did some sort of working with neural networks to figure out this is, is it, what digit is this? Is this a five? Is this a zero? Is this a nine, a one? Like what are each of these digits? The more, the better, because at the end of the day, it takes an image like an eight. Here it's flipped around because the background should be white and there should be black. But in any case, let's say that we had an image like this. We can extract, again, like as Keisha pointed out, the darker areas are going to have pixels closer, like that are smaller, closer to zero, like zero, one, on a scale of zero to 255. So again, it looks something like, um, No, oh, this is the video I put up. Uh, that's a big thing for it. Um, ah. And this is a typical scale, zero to 255 for colors. And you can just map each and every spot in this grid here of colors. You can map it to a value. So again, these are closer to 255. So this is just a bunch of data, rows and columns of data. And what's happening is that these are fed in. Like we look at a simple equation, you know, between X and Y. Similarly, if we give enough of this data, uh, it's going to figure out patterns, like what makes an eight an eight, because each image is, is becomes represented something like this. So after giving, and but the idea is that you might be wondering, oh man, this is, this is pretty scary, right? Like how can it just go from a set of images and numbers to learning? It's, it doesn't have eyes. You know, I was taking a course on the immune system in the spring and when the immune system, the police, the guardians of our, of our body. And the thing is that these don't have, they don't have eyes. Like all, they're, they're like blind, you know, like, like Helen Keller, they're, they're blind. Like, you know, they, they have to like feel around, like they have to recognize if there's like a virus or a pathogen or bacteria that's in the body. They need to use receptors to, to fit like on the cells to figure out like what is, not part of the body, what is part of the body. They need to see, a, they, they, they can't see, but they need to use their receptors to determine, you know, what is based on how they are trained. And if something goes wrong with the training of these immune cells and we get all these autoimmune diseases, or we can get like where immune cells are attacking other cells in our body, we can have cancers or we can be, um, get, get infections that, that maybe immune system is not recognizing viruses or bacteria, something will go wrong. So the idea is that when it's being trained, it's tried, It's given a lot of immune cells are given a lot of examples of what are typical cells in the body and what are other cells that maybe, um, and maybe they also are trained on what are viruses uh, or pathogens that are exposed, but they're trained on what is typical for the body. So anything that, they, that, that is not found in the body, they can then react to that. And it's a huge science. You know, I just took a course. There's so much more to it. But similarly, um, here, these models, these mathematical models, they don't have eyes, but we're trying to do artificial intelligence. We're trying to create things that can recognize even without eyes. We're trying to create something that can go from recognizing these images, recognizing my handwriting, to trying to figure out what I was trying to say in a format. I was a teaching assistant in, um, in, in undergrad, and I was grading students' handwriting that was super messy. 
And if I had an app like this, I could take their handwriting and translate it for me, even the messiest of handwritings into something that I could read and understand. That would be pretty helpful. So it's almost, it's super cool because no matter how I wrote my eight, it could be really sloppy. It does a job. Um, if I, let's see if I tried to do this, maybe it will change. Okay. And if I want to select, do you see that? Like this is asking how you want to collect, um, correct it. And when I make a correction, like let's say this is not what I wanted to do. It's going to then submit this correction to Microsoft that, hey, Sanya wasn't so happy about this. Do you see that? Like that's actually me telling it it was wrong, but it was trained on supervised data. Like people had to really mention what each image is. This is an eight. And the model learns some patterns of, it learns some really cool patterns. It learns what an eight is. It learns how to represent a seven. It learns how to recognize, you know, all of these. There are ways that you can sample an image. You can simplify it as well, but that's what it is. This, this is also an eight. Do you see that? This is also an eight, guys. It's written a different way, but you can almost see within the values itself, you can see, okay, at some point, there should be a small gap of small values, a, a large set of values around here, and then zero small values here. Do you see how this one looks, guys? Do you guys have any questions? So when I'm telling you guys to gather more data, it's because when we put these data into a model, they get represented into a data matrix. And then this data matrix is going to be representing what that concept is. Like if we're looking at shingles, if we're looking at eczema, if we're looking at of uh, Islamic architecture, modern architecture, Renaissance architecture, what we're looking at, it's going to get represented that way. And actually, this is how um, I found this, this detection. Um, how is an image captured, right? It all begins with the light which passes through the lens of a camera. By the lens, it's focused on the image plane. Image plane holds sensors, pixels, usually in a square or rectangle form. Sometimes they can be hexagonal or circular sensors, okay? So you can use size and resolution, image coordinate system here, the number of rows and number of columns, the pixels, the, the dimensionality of an image. If we look at this, I'm sure, like if we look at babies, for instance, we can look at, I think if we go to properties, it'll tell you, this, this will give you some uh, size on disk, I think there's a way here, advanced, to see the, the pixels. Let me see JPEG, uh, how many bytes, size, details. Okay, great. So we see that it is the width. Do you guys see this? Of that image that we were looking at, this baby being held up by the parent, right? Or by, you know. So it's, it's a thousand pixels width and the height is 584 pixels. Do you see that? Like how, how is this making sense to you guys? Now I'm getting anyone see something like I don't know if you yes, guys are there. It does. Okay, okay, okay. I right, thanks. Okay, thanks, Sharon. So 1,000 pixels by 584 pixels, great. So each of these pixels will be mapped to a value. So typically what we like to do is um, we can make these into black and white because what that does is it kind of subtracts because the idea is that that baby's happy or like if this baby's happy and wearing a white shirt, that really shouldn't detract, you know, like when you make something black and white, See, like, this is the like, guy, this is a watermark. So this image would sadly need to be edited. Like if, if you were doing like baby emotions or something, for instance. So, but in any case, the idea sometimes is that we can make this image black and white because the image of a baby, uh, of this, of the happy baby, for instance, should not be dependent on the color of the t-shirt. Like a lot of images in black and white, black and white sort of, whether I'm wearing this reddish shirt or I'm wearing a green shirt or a blue shirt, it should not like take away from anything. So that's the idea that 
whether I was writing this eight. So if I was writing this eight, um, if I was writing and if I was drawing, I'm Lincoln using a red pen versus a black pen that should not change things. You know, that does not mean that this is not Lincoln. Or if I'm drawing this using a pencil versus using like um, a Sharpie, like a red Sharpie marker, it should still be recognized as an eight. So people often just make them black and white as much as possible. Like, you know, they turn an image into grayscale. You know, like you guys, if you take photos and some of you guys may edit it, put it online, you know, in black and white or different hues or contrast, you guys can edit photos. It's kind of nice these days. You can edit almost any, any image that you want and add all the filters that you want to it. And the filters are just changing the pixel colors as well. And there's a whole science, you know, behind denoising. Um, a lot of object detection, um, a lot of um, computer vision projects are on how do you take an image. Um, I've been in the day where like some of the times I've been on a, on a family vacation, we take a group photo and at night and then sometimes in the wrong lighting and the image comes out completely badly and you can't see or an image is really dark and you can't make it out because low lighting. I know cameras are getting better, but how do you take that image with low light and how do you edit it to get like the lighting, get the color, you know, deep blur, get rid of the blurriness of an image. So people come up with algorithms and they come up with apps as well. They can take an image and get rid of all the other noise. They can add light to it. There are all these filters. Like, you know, I use pick monkey sometimes. Pick monkey. I like to use this app, the free version of an app. You know, you can take an image and you can change it. So you can add so much to an image. So that's what I'm trying to tell you guys when I'm saying that let's um, have you guys collect as much, uh, as much image data as possible. So how have you guys been so far in terms of collecting it? Have, is any update so far? Then I want, so the idea is that if two images uh, and this is another example I prepared to show you guys as well. So this is the scale. So like for instance, like let's say that gray is somewhere in between and white is like 255. Okay, so this is like zero is black. And then as you go down to grayish, like let's just put some number in the middle, which is 250 of 255 and zero, like, you know, 125 for instance. So this, so just pretend, guys, that this is an image. Like these are two images that we have. So pretend that these are two images here. Uh, let's see. Um, there. Okay. So this is one image and this is the other image. Okay, they look kind of similar, but yet there's some differences between them. So we can go through and assign these as values. So this is the idea behind removing duplicated images. So I was looking up, okay, how do we get rid of duplicate images? Yeah, and guys, do you have any questions on this? So this is the, this guys, again, it's a download link, again, that I have in my, um, on my in that video that I put up on my channel. Okay, okay, great. So one of the things that I was looking for that we've been asked is, how do you find duplicate images um, with Python? So how can you automate the search for duplicate images on your computer? So uh, this is written you know, by um, Elise Nanman on June 4th. So Okay, so I'm gonna read this out, then I want someone who can read this part next, okay? So I wanna to explain to you guys about the code as well. So did you ever find yourself in the situation of going through hundreds, maybe even thousands of images, only to realize that some actually look a bit too similar? And the, uh, what I told you about each image being a set of pixels and, and those pixels having values between zero and 255, if, it's, if the pixel, is a black and white, you know, otherwise it has red, green, blue components. Again, guys, like as we are scanning through this example here, we can find that each has like, you know, red, green, blue, each number, you know, oh, this is a nice color. You know, it's like, you know, it's changing red, green, blue. 
you know, red, green, and blue colors. It's all an ID. Each and every single, so if you have a good color and you want to replicate it using Microsoft Paint, which I love, you can always just like figure out the code. Okay, this is this exact number. Then you can punch it in. Like I can punch in like 82. I can punch in the number and it'll give me the same exact color if I find my favorite color. I can do it. Okay, it can, it can still be here, but it may not be available in the next session. <clears throat> so that's this. So if we download images, if you guys download images from multiple sites and you're wondering, the idea is you do not want to give too much weight to any image in a file. So if we have happy baby, if I have like two of these or three of these images, it's almost like I'm giving unfair weight to the model. The model's like, okay, you're repeating this again. There must be something really important about this image. When that may not be the case, we want everything to be fair. You know, if you're looking at happy babies, this is a happy baby, happy baby, happy baby. You know, these are all like happy babies. Each one should be typically just appear once. You do not want the algorithm, the code that's learning to, just, to be really focused on getting this one image right. So you want to have each, you want to have as many unique images as much as possible. So that's why we need to get rid of duplicate images because it's going to mess up our program. It's going to make it focus so much on getting, on matching that image. It's going to try to focus more on the images that appear multiple times by duplicate. So we need to, so as I'm telling you guys, like look up shingles or look up hippie zoster, like look up those images um, and get them from different sources. You may find duplicate images. As you're looking up London's BT Tower, as you're looking up um, the uh, British Telecom Tower, if you're looking up um, other modernist ones, you may get the same image multiple times um, from different sources. So that's a huge risk and you can eyeball them. But another thing you can do is to look at it in code. So this person came up with this idea, let's automate this process. So in today's article, I will go through a process of writing a Python 3.8. Well, that's what we're using, that's the version of Python um, script for the automated search for duplicated images in a folder on your local computer. Okay, does somebody want to read this part here? Oh uh, yeah, I can do it. Okay, thanks Keisha. In order to compare images to another, we need to somehow translate them into comparable computer readable uh, numeric data. Those of you that are familiar, familiar with machine learning and computer vision may already know that images can be translated into matrices or, precise, or more precisely into tensor. A tensor is a container which can hold data in n dimensions. A matrix, therefore, is a two-dimensional tensor. Uh, do you want me to read the image? Yeah, yeah, don't worry too much about this guy. Just know it's like red, green, and blue, like three colors. Okay, mm -hmm. every pixel in a colored image can be represented by a combination of red, green, and blue colors. These three then make up the unique color that this pic uh, pixel consists of. If we have one matrix for red, one for green, and one for blue, for all pixels, pixels in our image, we can layer the three matrices over each other to then end up with a tensor. Oh, great. So one thing I want to tell you is if you think of the, um, thank you, Keisha, so far. So if you think of the, if you think of this Abraham Lincoln image that we had, like each of them having a set of values. Similarly, if you guys check out in paint, you can see that that was a scale of white to black. And that's why sometimes we can make a photo gray scale. I mean, it went, it took us a while. Like, you know, my folks growing up had, had, had black and white TVs. They're talking about how when they saw the Olympics, it was in black and white. It's really hard to imagine like black and white TVs, right? But it's so much simpler. It's just one scale between zero and 255, black to white. But what colored, color TV, color anything is going on, is having not just white to black, not just only one scale, but it's having like the red scale, the green scale, the blue scale, like this based on the, the cones and rods and receptors in our, in our eyes, like how we can perceive the world around us. And Mike Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, he, I think he can only see shades of blue and black. So he's color blindness, so he can't see everything. And I think some creatures can see even more colors, which is amazing. Um, but you, there's so much more around our world that we may not even be able to see. And it's, we can't even comprehend that there can be even more colors that we're not aware of. Like that, I, I can't even imagine that. It's really hard. 
So the idea is that there are these three colors and similar to having something going from a uh, white to um, like white to black, you can have one for the red, red, you can have one for green and you can have one for blue. So those are the three colors, red, green, and blue, the three colors that are used to define color here. And the scale, you know, we can have red as zero, we can have red as zero, or we can have green at zero, and then we'll get some different color like blue. If we have blue at 255, we're gonna get like this color. You know, it's, it's all a scale. So we can take apart an image. Similarly, we can take the red parts of the image. It'll be detecting the red, the red, the red colors idea of the image out. Then there's a blue part that takes it, and there's a green part. The idea is that each and every single spot, I'll take this here, I'll use this brush, and I'll have like a small, oh, where did I put it? Let me just put it here. I'll have a small pixel here. Then I can take another one here. I think, you know, if I'm coming up with an image or something, if I traffic light, like let's say, you know, if I'm coming up with some, some image, then I can see what this is, color picker. I can edit this color, see what its hue is. I can take this yellow color, edit this color. I can see red, green, blue is zero. So that's the idea. And then in that matrix for red, I'm going to say, okay, that pixel, this pixel for the red matrix, it has this 255. For the green matrix, it has green matrix is a rows by columns that we saw for um, Abraham Lincoln and for that eight. It's, it's almost going to be, let me see if I can find that again, which is that image, image, image. Yeah, like for this A, for instance, or this, for instance, okay, great. Like how we have this for the black and white scale, we can have this for the red matrix, like the, the, the red values that it would have. We can, we can focus on one matrix just for these red values here, just for these red values. We can have a matrix just for this. We can have a matrix that's focusing on, so this, this, this yellow dot would be like in the red matrix, it'd be like 255, then in this green matrix, so this is a matrix here. In this green one, it would be like 242. In the blue matrix, it would be zero. So we can represent a colored image, but I'm saying that that could be a little bit more involved, which is why we tend to prefer maybe just keeping it black and white because um, we want to simplify things. So similarly, you can take an image and you can have it in the red, green, and blue components here. Does that make sense to you guys? So, so this is awesome because it means that we can represent our images by numbers. And already, you know, this, this should be some bell ringing. Numbers can be easily compared with each other. So if you can represent an image down to numbers, you can then see essentially if two images are the same by just comparing them with each other. There are things as you guys do programming that are like diff checker or things to tell the difference between this thing and this thing. Like you want to test the difference. So why not turn this image into numbers and then compare the two numbers between the two images to see how different they are. So assuming one image consists of the same exact tensor as another image, that means that, you know, if we're looking at a colored image, but oftentimes to simplify it, we can make it black and white and just focus on one matrix, which is just the scale from white to black. Does that make sense to you guys? Otherwise, we people typically have three three things that they're comparing: the red scale, the green scale, and the red the red, green, and blue. And this was so complicated that it did take us a while to go from black and white TVs to color TVs. You guys can talk to your parents or so, or potentially grandparents. You guys are super young to check with them about their time growing up with, with um, when they probably might remember color TV as being super new or that your grandparents would definitely um, have experience with black and white TV if, if they're still alive. 
Well, if we have them. Um, so this is the idea so far. So that somebody was coming up with this idea um, that if this is one image, so let's just call this is image one. Essentially, this is how we will detect duplicate images. Because code cannot see, it does not have eyes, guys. Only we have eyes, only we can see things. So you must think in your world around you, whenever you're programming or coming up with something, you must think, how can I represent this information in terms of numbers? If I can represent it in terms of numbers, I can then, um, that's what the program will make sense of. The program can only make sense of numbers, like our cells in our immune system, they cannot see, they can only make sense of receptors, you know, receptor binding to this receptor or this receptor triggering this. They don't have eyes in our bodies. Only we have eyes. We have eyes that can see, think, and perceive. And the way that our eyes can see, think, perceive is based on signals of neurons in our brain that we'll talk about. And then we thought of the idea that, hey, if neurons in our body, that they can signal and do things and transmit information, you know, of feelings, emotions, thoughts, senses, everything, then if we want artificial intelligence, can't we come up with something based on the, the model of how the human brain works? And that's what artificial intelligence, especially deep learning, have, have involved. Using how our minds think, how it signals, how these neurons signal with each other in our brain, coming up with a model that can take data, not just image data, but any data, and focus on how we can get those to signal with each other. So that's what is happening here. If we want to detect if these images are the same, firstly, do you guys think these images are the same? Like imagine this is one image and this is another image. Do you think they're the same? Uh, like the black and white look oh. different. Yeah, like imagine that this is, this is one whole image. I mean, this is one image. And this is another image. It's really simple, but I'm not really like good, good at drawing. So this is one image, this is another. They're not similar, right? Like, so so what differences do you notice? Uh, like there's more gray boxes. In, in image two, right? Like this part, right? Yeah. Are you able to annotate my screen? I think you can annotate my screen. Um, maybe. Yeah, you guys can draw directly on my screen. Sometimes when I was teaching a couple other classes, students can draw on my screen if you want to point at the differences. You, I think you can annotate it. It might be at the top of your, if I'm sharing my screen, it might be at the top if you're, if you're looking at Zoom, where, where if you have a drop down, maybe at the top, I think. And you can annotate my screen. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, awesome, great. That's one difference and there's another difference too. Mm -hmm. And then, yep, yep, uh, uh huh. And this, okay, great, great, thank you, thank you, Ithar. Yes, really great job. So, when you see these two images, they're not exactly the same. So, how can we detect the duplicates in the data? We can look at this as being one image and this as being another image. And then we can almost, so this is just like a really quick thing. I made it like black and white, but the images are really more complex than this, but to show you the concepts. So you can take this first image and you can map it to, to, to these. And you can take the next image and map it to this too. So you can take this and make this zero, 255, 125, like right in the middle. Like you said, if it's gray, I'll make it 125. Oh, okay. Okay, if you have to go. Um, but please make sure you collect the images for next week. So, um, like, so for, if you guys have to go, then um, please make sure you collect these images for next week. How, if you guys have filled out how many unique images that you have. So next week, I'll be checking to see how many images you guys have collected. So please collect at least. Oh, wow, Neil, this is great. 1,500 images of eczema. Okay, great. So then I'll show you guys. So yeah, then I'll share this part of the recording. So then um, if you guys have to go, I can share the recording then of how you can detect uh, duplicated images. But the idea is 
you're going to, this is a very simplified version of an image. So just imagine this image is just this. Um, okay, I shared it. Uh, did you get it? Okay. Okay, I shared the link again. So anyway, so um, so this is a zero to this. So you map this zero here. This is black. You make this zero. You make this two fifty five. You make this one twenty five. You just map these values on top of this. Does this make sense to you guys? How you map it? Does this make sense? So you map it to a set of values. So anytime it's black, it's, it's zero. Anytime it's white, it's 255. Anytime it's gray, it's 125. This is just really quick again, example again, guys, of the, what, what was happening behind the scenes for the, um, uh, behind the scenes for um, this. You know, how they, how they take like the black and they made it five. Here, I'm just making it zero, like zero here. And as it's getting closer to white, it's getting higher in intensity. That's all I'm doing here for each of the images. I'm just mapping them to values. And then what it's equivalent, it's a, it's a, it's a simplified idea, but I'm going pixel by pixel. And if they're the same, I'm sort of taking the difference between these two. If they're the same, it's zero. If the difference is in the pixel intensity, then that's what um, I'm having here. So this is like gray, this is black. So the difference is like, is 125 here. And then this distance between these two is given by 255. So again, um, it's given by, oh gosh. Like that, that's how you get like um, 130. So if the two images are identical, what do you expect? This, this is the difference between them. And then what you can do, for instance, like, like they, they, they square it, they do some calculation, but we can probably take the sum of the distances between these and the differences. And then we can see, okay, this is how far apart or something. Or actually I can just make, take the absolute value of this. Let me just take the absolute value. What absolute value is. If you guys learned of absolute value, it takes any negative number, makes it positive. So then that's what this would be, for instance. So if the two numbers are the same, what would you expect this matrix to be? This is the differences. So this above is the differences. So guys, if they're, if they're identical images, what would you expect this matrix to be? Like, let's say we have like an image like this and an image like this, what would the difference be? A zero? Yes, awesome. It will be all zeros. So it'll be like zero, 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 and then this will be zero, 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 zero. So here an image is like four pixels in width by three pixels. No, no, four pixels height by three pixels width. Four height, three width. So that's what it would be. Like the, the closer, if they're really like, sorry, the, the heights don't look the same, but like, if they're identical images, okay, so pretend that each of them is a pixel. So this is three pixels width. That's what this is saying. So if the two pixels are really close together or identical, then it would be zero, 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 zero. That's how you can tell. So let me go back to that image here. Does this make sense to you guys? Okay. So 
like translating images to numeric data. So this is the SK image, OpenCV. This is the computer vision that we use a lot, CV2. So let's start by writing a function. So this is a function, okay? So they've written a function to create images. It takes a directory. A directory is like, you know, the path to your images folder, what compression you want, create some global files, creates a list of all files in the directory, a file name in this for each of the files, you check if it's accessible, check if it's an image. Then what you do is you convert this image into a red, green, and blue format, you know, a red, green, and blue format. This specific, this function will create a tensor for each image. This function will create a tensor for each image our algorithm finds in a specific folder. We read it into our computer directory, iterate over all the files and make sure that the format of the files in our folder are actually images. There, there is a very handy library called, uh -huh, which can help us with these classes. Okay, great. So what happens, thank you, so is that iterating is, is, is like a for, is a for loop. That's a for loop. So hopefully you guys can probably understand not everything that's going on here, but you can understand this is a for loop and we can count, um, you know, we're just counting um, how many images that were not able to be working properly. Images that files that counted, you know, we're trying to figure out decode the image, decode, but this CVs, people have written libraries. Libraries are a bunch of packages. These are modules, you know, that have a bunch of functions people have written. The idea is don't reinvent the wheel. So guys, we could try to find, write this thing from scratch. It might take us a long time, but people have, have written libraries and code and it's open source, so they've shared it. So R, that I love using R as well. I use R for a lot of development work. Um, R and Python are open source, so you guys can come up with code with packages that do a lot of functions, and then you can share them with people. That you'll get credit for your work because if people use it, they were they're going to cite this person, these people's packages. You know, they're getting recognition here that we're using your packages here. So if you write them and you share them with the community, you can build your reputation up as a like a soft as a developer, as um, as a scientist. You know, as a like a very good for a helpful person in the community. So they share their code and we can, and some of their code, we call their functions like CV2, we can call CV2's um, IMD code. It takes an image and it turns it into the numerical data, you know, between, you know, red, green and blue data of, how, of the intensity, like the numbers for each pixel that converts it into those matrices for us. So then we, then OS start path that is directory um, it's checking if it is, you know, if there is a directory, this file name. Check if it is an image. If it is not an image, this function will return none and therefore move on to the next file in the directory. So one thing that it's doing is it's something that's called defensive programming. So it's first, checking if there is, check if the file is accessible and if the file format is an image. So one of the things I'm running right now for my research guys is I've been running this code overnight. Um, oh, wow. Okay, just finished running right now, guys. I've been running this code. It's been taking many, many, many days. This code is really, really long code um, that it takes. And it found so many, okay, wow. <coughs> See, this is like code. This is how I'm writing a full loop in R to go through this length. Oh, wow, this is great. It's going through every single file that I have and it's like concatenating it. This is code that I've written in R. Okay, um, let me just see this. Oh, wow, I've been waiting for this for days. I was just showing you guys the idea that code can take a long time to run. And what you really, what I really need is if there's any mistake in my code, 
if I left it overnight and I did not equip for defensive programming, then that would be pretty bad, right? Like, so I need to have defensive programming where in this case, if you're having this code run through a set of images, if even if you don't have some, if sometimes when you download from the site, you may get some SVG files or other like junk as you guys might've seen from downloading on this, um, this plugin, you may get some like that, you know, download all images. You may get some things that are not quite images and you don't want this code. If you leave it, you're going outside, you're just going for a walk, you know, watching some TV, hanging out. You don't want this code to just crash and that's it. As soon as it encounters an error, it stops and you come back after hours and then the code that you thought was running actually crashed and stopped. Like I've been through that before. So you need to incorporate defensive programming. So they're first checking, they're going through each file and the image path that you gave. So you'd like in reality, just give like a path, like this is the path, like it's on my F drive on my, on my hard drive here. Then it would be on ha baby emotions, happy baby, for instance. And then I would take these image, like this file link and I would give it to the code. So that's what I would do here. And I'll show you guys how to do it in the coding center. And if it cannot find like, and if, if as it's going through each image and comparing it, if it encounters something that's not an image, it's just going to skip it. So that is defensive programming. In both outputs, a function moves on to the next line where we use this library to decode our image, convert it to a tensor. A tensor is basically um, the red, blue, and green representation of an image. Like it's a matrix of the red, red parts of it, matrix of the green part, matrix of the blue part. And again, you can just think of it like if you're going through an image, if just for, go through an image, just focusing on this red part, pixel by pixel, look at your red matrix. Go through the, the picture, focusing on the green part next. Whatever these green values are, you know, you're going through your image, just focus on the green parts, you know, like row by row, column by column, like just scan along the pixels and the image and go across each of the images. I mean, each of the pixels in the image. Then you'll get your green matrix. Then you can also, uh, you'll get your green matrix. Um, that's how you will get, so again, the red, this red part you'll get from going across, you know, going, getting all these red 74, getting your 215, getting all those values pixel by pixel is your red matrix. Your green is just focusing on the green values and your blue is focusing on just the blue. And then that's what you're doing here. And then make sure it has three layers at maximum. We resize it. We want it to have a pixel width and a height of 50 to do this. We speed up the comparison process. If we have high resolution images, their respective tensor will also be very large resulting in this. Um, we, we finally, we add the resulting compressed tensor to our images matrix list and go on with the next file in our directory. Um, then we compare, then we, how are we going to compare each image with the next? We check the similarity using something that's called a mean squared error. That's also used in um, like the regression problems we were doing when we have the f of x of functions and we are trying to find the line of best fit. That often has the uh, mean squared error, the, the difference between the actual and the predicted value squared. It minimizes it, has, has it as small as possible. So, so don't worry too much about that. Just, I just wanted to show you a very babyish example here. You have these two images here and you can just take the difference pixel by pixel between them. That's sort of what is happening here. You know, it's the, um, between this is some of the square difference. I'm just showing you the square difference. So in reality, what you would do is you just take the difference between this pixel and this, and this image Minus, and so they, they, they convert the images to the same scale, like same height and width. Um, they compress it, they make the images into the same pixel ratio. So there's other packages that convert the image into the same height and width ratio of pixels. But then what they do is you go pixel by pixel. So these are four um, pixels high, three pixels wide, and then they can square the differences. So that's what this is doing. I don't want to confuse you guys too much, but um, they, they can just square it. So what this is doing is it's taking this distance minus this distance squared. And remember we talked about a summation. 
plus this distance. So then, then what this is, is, is this is the distance between these two squared. They're the same, so it's zero. This one is 125 minus zero squared. 125 squared, if you guys check, is 15,625. So you take all these squared differences together and then you sum them up. So this sum is coming from the 16,900 plus this 15,625 plus this 1,625. You, you sum them up. And then N is a number of total pixels. So if it's four pixels wide, a four pixels high and three pixels wide, how many total pixels are there in this image, in each image? 12? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. So then what, what you're taking here is you have this and you divide it by 12. So then this is this value. This is this mean squared area. So this will tell you that the, diff, that the distance between these two images is 4,012.5. So given the number of pixels that it has, it's pretty far out. Like imagine if we had a, the, pixel, like the image was like this huge and then this, there's only a few differences. It's not as bad, right? If you, if you have such a small image, and they already have, like, as Atari pointed out, they have like differences here and here. Like if three out of the 12 are already kind of different, then that's a pretty big part of the image that's different. So that's what mean squared error is. So they take the image and that you provide it, they convert the image into numbers and then they are performing up then. So they take the images you provide them they scale the images to the same dimensions, like height and width being the same. So they, there's another function that scales them. And then what they do is they calculate the distance between the two images using this mean squared error. So it's an average, that's what the mean is saying, it's an average. So we have 12 pixels. So I divide this number by 12, this total difference. So I look at pixel by pixel, I look at the difference between this pixel and this pixel squared. I, for each respectively, I do this calculation. So this and this, I have this. Next, what I have is I do this here for this and this, I have this. Does it make sense, guys? Yeah. Okay, great, great, awesome. So that's what this is. And then, um, you, so that's what they define this. So what you can see here is this is how you can take a formula. Like I even told you guys, you can, um, you might have seen this in math class or you might see it soon, but you can take a math formula. And as we were doing before, you can convert it into a function. So this is from one image and this is the next image. All that's saying is that you just compare the respective pixel and you take the difference between them and you square it. And so you, you just take this, you take this image and then this image, and then you can just take the difference. So this, what this does is it just subtract. So people have written out this function that, that takes the two matrices and subtracts them like the values and then squares it. That's what this is doing. This is just a function using NumPy. We, a similarity between it. The lower this number, the more similar these images are. And do you guys know why that's the case? The lower this number, the more similar the images are. Do you guys know why? So they're saying the lower this number. Do you, do you know why? Atari, do you know why that's the case? The lower the number, the more similar the images? Um, no, not really. Now, it has to do something with what we were seeing here, which is if the images are exactly the same, then what happens here? Um, they have like a, a low number. If the images are identical, yes, then it's like zero, zero, zero. There's zero difference between them. This is capturing the difference between the images. 
we're, we're looking at the difference between the pixel values in two images, right? So if I gave you guys, if I gave you, if I, if, so think of it for a second. So forget I gave you the answer. So if I gave you this image and this image, if you were a computer, I'll be like the computer, like I can't see anything. I don't know. So you're like, okay, how do I show you? How do I show the computer how to generate the same image? The way that the computer understands it, like if you guys take computer science, you might learn something about, uh, you know, bits and bytes in computer code, like binary digits. You might learn about zero ones. It's a little bit confusing, but like all this hexadecimals and all those things, you might learn about how a computer, how we can translate everything that's going on in a computer behind the scenes. So similarly, the computer will say, hey, Sanya, hey, Atayev, hey, hey, guys. I don't know what exactly this image looks like. So you'll be like, okay, let me tell you in something you understand. Let me tell you in terms of numbers. This is this image. This image is just zero. So at the end of the day, what you're going to tell this is you're going to say, hey, hey computer, listen. This computer, I mean, sorry, this, this image is just these values here. That's what you're going to tell. You're going to say, it's just these values. This is this first image here. And this is this next um, image here. So you, you, you take this image, you take this image, you take this image and you convert them into these numbers. And then, the, then what do you think that you would do if you were a computer? How could you tell how, how similar the images are to each other? What would you do? Shan, do you know what you would do again if you had to see how similar the images are to each other? Uh, compare the difference between the values of the pixels. Mm -hmm. And you would go the respective pixel, this pixel yes. with this, yes, exactly. This pixel with this pixel, this pixel here with this pixel. Each pixel you will compare that and you're going to keep track of the differences between them. It's almost like if I gave it to you, you'll be saying, okay, this part is the same. If I give you a really complicated um, photo and I'm like, can you detect the differences between them? It's almost like you're going to be marking, this is fine, this matches this, okay, this matches this, okay, that's fine. Oh, okay, this doesn't match this, huh? And that's what this is doing. This is saying zero with zero, 255 with 255. 125 and zero, oops, that's a mistake, uh-oh. And then we're going to check, okay, that's a mistake. I have to be uh, I have to be cautious about this. This seems like it's a mistake here. This seems like a mistake. So you're going to alert it. Then you're going to scan, okay, 255, which is this white, white and white. Yep, that's fine. This is fine. That's fine. Next, black, black. Okay, yep, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, great. Then we see the same thing here. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, that's great. We're going to go to the next line. Z uh, zero, 255, and then this. Uh oh, there's a difference between them. This is white, this is gray. This is 255, this is 125. There's a difference between them here. Similarly here, this is black, this is gray. This is zero, this is 125. Uh oh, there's a difference between them. And then here, this is a white and white here. That's fine. Here, this is black and black. Okay, white and white, fine, black and black, fine, right? Zero, 255, zero, zero, 255, zero, fine. So we're keeping track of the differences. So that's what this is doing. So anytime, so if you take this minus this and you square it, zero minus zero is zero, zero squared is zero. Anytime they are exactly the same, this difference is zero. Does that make sense? And this thing just squares it. Any and this is just dragging the formulas across. I just, just trust that this is the same thing. This, this is taking this across. This is, these are just small little Excel hacks. So um, do you guys see that? You take these differences and then you sum them up together. So I can just take this value plus this value plus this value plus this. Oh, I can also just write something, et cetera, et cetera. Or oh, I can just sum up each of the values or oh, I can just do the sum. The sum, 
And just another Excel thing that just sums across all the values. It's an Excel trick. Okay, so that's what this is over here. And then the other thing is I just divide it by the number of pixels in the image, which is I can say like it could be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Or I can just say that it's four pixels high by three wide, so that's 12, four times three is 12. So then it's an average, so I'm going to divide. I can just take this value here divided by 12, divided by this value here, which is in um, M35. That's what I will get the um, uh, av av difference, the average, This just makes sense. Like, does this make sense to you guys? Um, I thought it doesn't make sense. So now if two images are identical, why would this be a low value? Um, because it finds like the similar pixels to each other. And then um, it calculates like the difference between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if the two images are identical or more identical, like let's say uh, if we have Okay, let me show you another example. Like, let's say that instead, this is also a black, right? So what should this be here? If I change this to a black, what should this be? Um, black? Like, 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 what value would it be? Uh, zero. Yes, zero. And now what do you see happens? The indifference between them. Uh, becomes lower yeah because this is just a difference so the more that they're different that the higher this is it's almost like how different are you guys right so then as as it as we as the images become more and more similar to each other uh, this value tends to decrease right like this is the difference because now no longer is there a difference here we eliminate this difference do you see that now, if you, if you want to try something else too, like let's say that we make this, this part gray, what should this be? If this is gray, then what would this be? Keshav, do you know what this would be? Uh, no. Oh, if, if this is gray, then what would this be instead of zero? Like, like what value? 125. Yes, thank you, Sharon. 125, exactly. Then this value will decrease down, the difference will decrease down to 1,408. Does that make sense? So as the image is now, there's just one spot of difference if you guys were to check the difference between these two images where you would say is it's just here that's the only spot of difference now otherwise they look exactly the same they're just one pixel off about them so that's exactly what this code is doing at the end of the day it's just calculating them and the closer they are the lower the number the more similar they are to each other and then you can choose which target you you want, like for the images to be similar. You know, do you want like what if, is this is this enough for you to say that the two images are similar to each other? Is one thousand four hundred and eight a threshold? Like what is at what point will you say the images are similar to each other? Like what if instead like what if this is a really really light gray? Like let's say it's not quite gray, but it's something light. Will you say that these two images are similar? Like let's say instead of two fifty five. It's like 200. And then the MSE shrinks down to 468. Like let's say it's something really light. So I mean, as it's going closer to, to black, it gets um, the numbers fall. So I made it from 255 down to 200. So at what point, what threshold do you use? That's what this is saying. I choose an MSE to be the maximum. As soon as uh, two images have uh, are more less than 200 different from each other, I think that they're du duplicates. 
So what it's doing is, you know, if images are rotated, it rotates them around till it finds if they're duplicates. The people have written really nice things, right? If, if, the, if the difference is less, so right now, these would not be called duplicates. But let's say, okay, this is 468. So let's say that I make this a bit darker. You can see red, green, blue, right? The hue. I can make this maybe 180 or something. 252, okay, let me just make this 170. Okay, so now, now, now because it's MSC, the difference between them is less than 200, they will be classified as duplicates according to that code. So now these two are classified as duplicates. Does it make sense, guys? That's how this code is working. They're classified as duplicates. Ah, these are duplicates. So that's how this code is working. These are duplicates. So what this is, there's a script here. And on this script, you can see duplicate file, Golden Gate, San Francisco. Use the following function to make DIF search for duplicates in the specified folder. Folder path must be specified as a Python screen. Additional parameter is this. So what we'll do is I have this, so you we take this code here and you can copy this into the coding center. 